For well over two centuries now, we are caught in a debate between two models of organization of human affairs. The ethnically pure state, aka nation state, and the multicultural state, comprised of numerous ethnicities, cultures, and civilizations from all over the world. The debate is far from decided. My name is Sam Bakni, and I'm a columnist in Brussels Morning. And today we are going to discuss the loaded question. Nation states and minorities, an oxymoron, or perhaps an ideal to aspire to. The recent wars in Ukraine and in Gaza gave rise yet again to the question whether Hamas and the pro-Russian militias in Donetsk, whether these are terrorists or perhaps insurgents or freedom fighters. But this conundrum is a throwback to the olden, not golden, times of colonialism. James Cook misled the British government back home by neglecting to report about the aborigines he had spotted on the beaches of New Holland. And this convenient omission allowed him to claim the territory for the crown. In the subsequent waves of colonization, the aborigines perished. Modern Australia stands awash in their blood, is constructed on their graves, thriving on their confiscated lands. The belated efforts to redress these wrongs meet with hostility and atavistic fears of the dispossessor. The same, of course, applies to the convoluted and gory interactions between Native Americans, aka erroneously as uh, Indians, and the white Euro European settlers. In Alt Neuland, translated to Hebrew as Tel Aviv, the feverish tome composed by Theodor Herzl, Judaism's improbable visionary. The author refers to the Arabs. He refers to them as Negroes who have nothing to lose and everything to gain from the Jewish process of colonization, as pliant and compliant butlers replete with gloves and tarbushes, livery, he called it. In the book, German Jews prophetically land at Haifa, the only port in erstwhile Palestine. They are welcomed and escorted by Britishized Arab Negro gentlemen's gentlemen, who are only too happy to assist their future masters and colonizers to disembark. Frequently, when religious or ethnic minorities attempted to assimilate themselves within the majority, the latter reacted by spawning racist theories and perpetrating genocide. Consider the Jews. By the way, Freud called it the narcissism of small differences. Consider the Jews. The Jews have tried assimilation twice in the two tumultuous millennia since they have been exiled by the Rome, Romans from their ancestral homeland. They've tried it in Spain during the 14th and, 14th and 15th centuries. They converted en masse to Christianity. They became conversos or as they were disparagingly maligned by the old Christians, Maranos, pigs. It was an honest attempt to fit in, to blend, to mingle. As B. Netanyahu observes in his magnum opus, The Origins of the Inquisition in 15th century Spain, the struggle against the conversos, the converted Jews, who by virtue of their Christianity sought entry into, the, into Spanish society, this struggle led to the development of a racial doctrine and a genocidal solution to the conversal problem. Exactly the same happened centuries later in Germany. During the 19th century, Jews leveraged newfound civil liberties and human rights to integrate closely with their society. Their ascendance and success were rejected by Germans of all walks of life. The result was again the emergence of Hitler's racist policies based on long expounded theories and the genocide known as the Holocaust. In between these extremes of annihilation and assimilation, 
modern Europe has come up with a plethora of models and solutions to the question of minorities, a question which plagues it and still does. Two schools of thought emerged, the nationalistic ethnic versus the cultural. 19th century social thinkers turned freedom fighters discovered that it is easier to unite a disparate mob, mob and motivated to achieve common goals when issues are cast in terms of a threat to its identity, however mythical or counterfactual it may be. And so race, nation and history trump equality and justice or even prosperity and liberty when it comes to spawning cohesive goal-oriented other excluding collectives. Europe has always been torn between centrifugal and centripetal forces. Multi-ethnic empires alternated with swarms of mini-states with dizzying speed. European Unionism clashed with brown turning black nationalism and irredentism. Universalistic philosophies such as socialism fought racism tooth and nail. European history became a blood-dripping pendulum swung by the twin yet conflicting energies of separation and integration. The present is no different. The dream of the European Union confronted the nightmare of a dismembered Yugoslavia throughout the last decade of its life. And ethnic tensions are seething all across the continent. Hungarians in Romania and Ukraine, um, in Slovakia, uh, in Serbia, Bulgarians in Moldova, Albanians in Macedonia, Russians in the Baltic countries, even Padans in Italy, and the list is long. The cultural school of coexistence envisages multi-ethnic states with shared philosophies and value systems which do not infringe upon the maintenance and preservation of the ethnic identities of their components. The first socialists adopted this model enthusiastically. They foresaw a multi-ethnic, multicultural, socialist megastate, a big tent. The socialist values, they believe, will serve as the glue binding together the most disparate of ethnic elements. In the event, it took a lot more than common convictions. It took suppression on an unprecedented scale, and it took concentration camps, and it took the morbid application of the arts and sciences of death. These countries became death cults. And even then, both the Nazi Reich, Stalinist USSR, fell ultimately to ethnic pieces, disintegrated into the ingredients and components. The national or nationalistic school supports the formation of ethnically homogeneous states, if necessary, by humane and gradual or inhumane, inhuman and abrupt ethnic cleansing. Homogeneity is empirically linked to stability and therefore to peace, economic prosperity and oftentimes to democracy. Heterogeneity breeds friction, hatred, violence, instability, poverty and authoritarianism. The conclusion of these schools of thought is simple. Ethnicities cannot coexist. Ethnic groups, also known as nations, must be left to their own devices. Put differently, they must be allocated a piece of land and allowed to lead their lives as they see fit. The land thus allocated should correspond as closely as possible with the birthplace of the nation, the scenery of its past and the cradle of its culture. The principle of self-determination allows any group, however small, to declare itself a nation and to establish its own nation-state. And this has been carried to laughable extremes in Europe after the Cold War has ended, with numerous splinters of former states and federations now claiming nationhood and consequently statehood. The shakier both claims appeared, the more virulent the ensuing nationalism. And so, the nationalist school, increasingly dependent on denial and on the repression of the existence of heterogeneity and of national minorities. And the national school did this denial, did this suppression of the minorities in three ways. The most famous and decried of which is known as ethnic cleansing, 
Greece and Turkey exchanged population after the First World War. Czechoslovakia expelled the Sudeten Germans after the Second World War, and the Nazis rendered big parts of Europe Judenrein. Bulgarians forced Turks to flee. The Yugoslav succession wars were not wars in the Klausewitz sense, rather they were protracted guerrilla operations intended to ethnically purge swaths of the motherland. The second solution was ethnic denial. In 1984, the Bulgarian communist regime forced the indigenous Turkish population to bulgarize their names. The Slav minorities in the Hungarian part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire were forced to magyarize, hungarize, following the 1867 compromise. Magyarization, it was called. Franco Spain repressed demands for regional autonomy, as does current day Spain. Other more democratic states fostered a sense of national unity by mass media and school indoctrination. Every facet of life was subjected to and incorporated in this relentless and unforgiving pursuit of national identity, sports, chess, national holidays, heroes, even a sense of humor. The particularisms of each group gained meaning and legitimacy only through and by their incorporation into the big picture of the nation. And so Greece denies to this very day that there are Turks or Macedonians on its soil. Counterfactually, they are. They are only Muslim Greeks, the Greek government insists, often brutally and in violation of human and civil rights. The separate identities of Brittany and Provence were submerged within the French collective, and so was the identity of the Confederate, Confederate South in the current United States. And many people call this cultural genocide. <clears throat> But the nationalist experiment has failed miserably. It was pulverized by a million bombs, slaughtered in battlefields and concentration camps, set ablaze by fanatics and sadists. The pendulum swung. In 1996, Hungarians were included in the Romanian government, and in 1998, they made it to the Slovakian one. In Macedonia, Albanian parties take part in all the, took part in all the governments since independence. The cultural school on the ascendance was able to offer its own three variants. Number one is local autonomy. Ethnic minorities are allowed to use their respective languages in certain municipalities where they constitute more than a given percentage, usually 20, of the total population. Official documents, street signs, traffic tickets and education all are translated to the minority language as well as to the majorities. This rather meaningless placebo has a surprisingly tranquilizing effect on restless youth and nationalistic zealots. In 1997, police fought local residents in a few Albanian municipalities in Macedonia precisely on this issue. The second solution, the culturalist, the multi-ethnic, multicultural proponents propose, is the territorial autonomy. Ethnic minorities often constitute a majority in a given region. Some host countries allow them to manage funds, collect taxes, and engage in limited self-governance. This is the regional or territorial autonomy that Israel offered to the Palestinians, perhaps too late, and that Kosovo and Vojvodina enjoyed under the 1974 Yugoslav constitution, which Milosevic threaded, shredded to very small pieces. <laughs> And this solution was sometimes adopted by the nationalist competition itself. The Nazis dreamt up at least two such territorial final solutions for the Jews, one in Madagascar and one in Poland. Stalin gave the Jews a decrepit wasteland, Bigobijan, to be their homeland. And of course there were the South African homelands. The third solution is the pers personal autonomy. Karl Renner and Otto Bauer advanced the idea of the individual as the source of political authority, regardless of his or her domicile. Between the two world wars, Estonia gave personal autonomy to its Jews and to its Russians. Wherever the, these people were, they were entitled to vote and elect representatives to bodies of self-government. 
These had symbolic taxation powers, but exerted more tangible authority over matters educational and cultural. And this idea, however benign sounding, encountered grave opposition from right and left alike. The right-wing exclusive nationalists rejected it because they regarded minorities the way a sick person regards his germs or bacteria. And the left-wing inclusive nationalists saw in it the seeds of discrimination and anathema. How and why did we find ourselves embroiled in such a mess? It is all the result of, the ro of wrong terminology, an example of the power of words. The Jews and Germans came up with the objective, genetic, racial and organic nation. Membership was determined by external factors over which the member individual had no control. The French civil model, an 18th century innovation, regarded the nation and the state as voluntary collectives bound by codes and values which are subject to social contracts. No place for genetics here. Benedict Anderson called the letter Imagined Communities. Naturally, it was a Frenchman, Ernst Renan, who wrote, Nations are not eternal. They had a beginning and they will have an end. And they will probably be replaced by a European confederation. He was referring to the fact that nation states were nothing but, at the time, a century-old invention of dubious philosophical pedigree. The modern state was indeed invented by intellectuals, historians and philologists, and then solidified by ethnic cleansing and the horrors of warfare. Jacob Grimm virtually created the chimeral Serbocrat language. Claude Fourier dreamt up the reincarnation of ancient Greece in its eponymous successor. The French sociologist and anthropologist Marcel Maus remarked angrily that it is almost comical to see little-known, poorly investigated items of folklore invoked at the peace conference as proof that the territory of this or that nation should extend over a particular area because a certain shape of dwelling or bizarre custom was still in evidence. Archaeology, anthropology, philologies, history, and a host of other disciplines, sciences, and arts were invoked and are still being invoked in effort to substantiate a land claim or a land grab. And no land claim has been subjected to a statue of limitations. No subsequent, subsequent conquest or invasion or settlement legitimize it. Witness the Dacian wars between Hungary and Romania over Transylvania. Other Romanians, latter day Dacians, or did they invade Transylvania long after it was populated by the Hungarians? Who can tell? Witness the Israelis and the Palestinians. And needless to add, witness the Serbs and the Albanians, the Greeks and the Macedonians, the Macedonians and the Bulgarians and so on. And so the modern nation state was a reflection of something more primordial, of human nature itself, as it resonated in the national founding myths, most of, most of them fictitious or contrived. The supranational dream is to many a nightmare. Europe is fragmenting into micronations, even as it is unifying its economy. And these two trends are not mutually exclusive, as is widely and erroneously believed. Actually, they are mutually reinforcing, in my view. As the modern state loses its major economic roles and functions to a larger supranational framework, the European Union, it also loses its legitimacy and its raison d'etre. The one enduring achievement of the state was a replacement of allegiance to a monarch, to a social class, to a region, or to a religion. So, the nation state replaced these allegiances to a monarch, to a social class, to a region, to a religion, with an allegiance to a nation. And this subversive idea came back to haunt itself. It is this allegiance to the nation that is the undoing of tolerant, multi-ethnic, multi multi-religious, abstract modern states. To be a nationalist is to belong to ever smaller and more homogeneous groups, and to dismantle the bigger, all-inclusive polity, which is the modern state. Look what's happening in the United Kingdom. Indeed, the state is losing in the battlefield of ideas 
to the other two options, micronationalism, homogenous and geographically confined, and reactionary affiliation. Micronationalism gave birth to Palestine and to Kosovo, to the Basque land and to Quebec, to Montenegro and to Moldova, to regionalism and to local patriotism, and now to the Donetsk republics in, uh, on Russia's border. Micronationalism is a fragmenting force. Modern technology makes many political units economically viable, despite their minuscule size, and so they declare their autonomy and often aspire to independence. Reactionary affiliation, the second solution, is cosmopolitan. Think about the businessman, the scholar, the scientist, the pop star, the movie star, the entrepreneur, the arbitrageur, and the internet. People feel affiliated to a profession, to a social class, to a region, to a religion, more they do than they do to their state. And hence the phenomena of expats, mass immigration, international management, managers class. This is a throwback to an earlier age when the modern state has not yet been invented. Indeed, the predicament of the nation state is such that going back may be the only benign way of going forward.